back, everyone, to the Zojo Talk podcast. I am Paul Lefever, the Zojo Developer Evangelist. My guest this time is Terry Utzler. He is the programmer and sales guy at SoftBase Development, Inc. And they make enterprise software, which we'll be talking about a bit, probably at length. So welcome, Terry. Well, thank you, Paul. It's good to be with you. Terry and I have been trying to coordinate this podcast for a, a really long time. And Probably kind of a year just, and a half. <laughs> yeah, a year, like a year and a half. And it fell together quickly in the last couple of weeks, so that's awesome. And it's great to have you here, Terry. So uh, why don't we start by having you give a little bit about your background and, you know, how you use Zojo, how you came to use Zojo, what your company does, all that sort of fun stuff. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> been programming most of my life. Uh, worked for... Uh, rather large uh, forklift dealership in LA for a while and uh, was writing COBOL based software on their mainframe for a while, developed a whole enterprise software over there and uh, eventually, and that was very successful, but uh, the problem was the owner decided, well, I want to sell the company. Well, there went my software. <laughs> so uh, my partner and I, uh, who were, we worked together there. We uh, decided, you know, windows is becoming, mature enough, we can start to do this. And so we ended up uh, picking up, I picked up Visual Basic 1.1 <laughs> off the shelf one day and started programming with that. And uh, it's like, hey, I think this might be possible. It's a little limited right now, but I think it's possible. So along comes VB2 and uh, gets a little more possibilities with databases and that kind of thing. So I found some local ISAM-based <laughs> databases to work with. And got that all connected up. And then, lo and behold, Microsoft introduces Microsoft Access. And it's like, oh, this is fast. <laughs> so we're able to uh, develop a product and then eventually, of course, into VB6 in the later days of that. And uh, develop an entire enterprise software based off initially with Access, but then eventually into SQL Server from Microsoft as the uh, database. And it was, uh, you know, it was quite successful, doing very well for us. The company was growing adding customers all the time, adding features and all that kind of good stuff. But uh, lo and behold, uh, again, Microsoft, uh, you know, the change uh, people that they are um, without That's much thought, sure. yes. <laughs> without much thought for what the consequences would be because they only have, you know, their little uh, goals in mind, um, not ours, but uh, decided to go with this .NET thing, uh, I'll call it. And uh, I, I did the conversion, you know, tried to convert some code over from VB6 over to VB.net. And it's like, there is no way I'm going to try to maintain this code on this large an application by myself uh, over time and keep my customers happy. So that's when I started looking for some other kind of development product uh, to fill this now gap because uh, no more is going to be happening with VB6 and still has some issues right, that right. Uh, we need to solve. So, and and integrating the .NET isn't, I mean, even though they both use the term VB, they're totally different things. So it's, Yeah, it was just a different enough language that it was not fun. <laughs> and I, I was not looking forward to the prospect of seeing how it converted, what you had to do for similar things. Like, no, that that's just too much. Too much debugging would be involved. Too much, you know, it was, just, it was much bulkier and uh, more complicated that way. And I was not looking forward to that. So. That's when I launched into my search, and this was, um, gosh, 2006, 2007-ish, something like that, looking at a lot of different products, and uh, I stumbled across this uh, um, multi-platform, uh, cross-platform uh, product, and uh, it was still based on, loosely based on BASIC, which, of course, obviously familiar with, with VB and all the other BASICs we've had through the years uh, prior to that on DOS and whatever else. And so I was wanting to stick with that. And that's when I found, uh, I guess it was called real basic at the time and then eventually real studio and then eventually Sojo. And, uh, but I found that started dinking with that a little bit, uh, wrote some little points of point of sale cafe software, you know, for the, uh, baristas and whatever, you know, different places. And that, uh, turned out fairly well. And it was a good learning curve for me and wrote some other, simple database stuff uh, for some other friends and, and just getting more familiar with the code. And it's like, it's, it was different enough that there was enough of a learning curve, but it was a, a definite 
um, more than good enough, and, and in fact, a, quite a great replacement for VB6. And uh, now that I've had some time under my belt with uh, Zojo and learn all the, the differences and how to convert the, the VB6 over the Zojo, there's just so much more I can do with Zojo now than I ever could uh, with the VB6 uh, environment. So it's been quite a, a, a very successful change that we made moving over to uh, Zojo and uh, all the added kind of uh, feature sets that uh, Zojo allows and all the plugins from the wonderful developers like uh, you know, with the Monkey Bread software and Einhuger and, and some of the others. And then, of course, uh, Bikini Software got some his plugins too. And uh, it's, it's made our product so much better and uh, much more competitive in the marketplace uh, that we deal in. So very happy with that, uh, that choice we made back then. Have you moved everything out of VB6 at this point? Um, <laughs> out of the half a million lines of code or so that we have got written in this uh, enterprise package, there are just four minor functions that I have not got converted over yet. And those are slated here for the next couple of months to knock so out. You def- you've been doing this over, you know, almost 10 years now and in bits and pieces. And all right, that's uh, cool. Yeah, of course, at first, not with this product, just a learning curve with the first couple of years with, you know, 2007 to 2009, that kind of time frame. So, but yeah, it's been a little while, you know, good, uh, what would that be, seven seven, almost eight years. Uh, but it, it, we, we did it in a way that you could use both versions of our product at the same time on the same machine, all talking to the same database. So people re- are able to make a gradual switch over to our newer product that's written in the Zojo as opposed to the older one. We call old one is 2.1, new version is 3.0. Um, and just making that gradual switch over for people and that's been a lot easier on them <laughs> their staffs you know we've our customers are anywhere from you know five users or so on up to about a hundred users uh you know using the product simultaneously on uh, you know one system spread across multiple branches and that kind of thing as well so gradual <laughs> smooth kind of switchovers, those are good things in uh, my kind yeah, of business. Yeah, yeah, definitely. On projects, enterprise stuff I've worked on in the past, same sort of thing. You often have to keep the old one and the new one up and running together because, you know, the new one's not just going to ship, you know, boom out the door with every feature the old one had. There's, that's just not practical. No, definitely not practical. And uh, then people, of course, remain comfortable with the old one. They've used it a long time, so you want to give them some period of time to, you know, get used to the new one, but fall back to the old one if they, you know, get stuck or something like that. It's, yeah. It reminds me a bit of what Apple did when they transitioned, uh, you know, Mac OS X. They had that classic environment that kind of ran inside of it, oh, so yeah. people could still rely on the old stuff, but, you know, get a feel for the new stuff, and then eventually that just fades away. Yes, it did, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, I was... Uh... Actually, in the old days, before I even wrote this uh, product in VB, uh, I was a Mac guy. But, you know, of course, programming on the mainframes at the time and COBOL and all that and having to deal with PCs uh, there on site as being the IT manager there. Uh, But I was still the Mac guy. So I had my Mac and ran my recording studio I had as well at the time. And uh, and eventually, uh, there was a period of time there I actually ran the the recording studio as my living uh, in between that you know, large company I worked for out there before I started this company uh, with this product. Cause it took a couple of years to uh, write the initial product in VB before we could, you know, actually start a company and have a product to offer and sell. So I had that uh, kind of transition there with all uh, with the Mac and everything, but I had to switch over to PCs in order to do all the uh, uh, programming with VB. And so, but now with Zojo, I'm all Mac again. <laughs> <laughs> which is so much better. It's just so much better for me anyway to work in that environment and still produce the native uh, Windows code and, and the Mac code now too. So uh, yeah, that's, makes our I customers mean, happy. You see that in general. I and mean, a lot of developers, even if they're not necessarily 100% Mac developers, often will grab a Mac because it's so easy to run all operating systems on a Mac that you can you can set it up. So. You know, I run Windows and Linux and everything. I got virtual machines out the wazoo. It's great. <laughs> yeah, you and me both. I uh, Because the old code, um, I have to keep uh, XP Pro in a virtual machine all the time, believe it or not, in order to, if I have, you know, to, to copy some code from the old 
stuff in order to do the conversion into Zojo. I still have to have uh, XP Pro in order to have that. And I've had to do a couple little minor uh, bug fixes here and there. Um, haven't had to do any for, I think, a couple years. But So I've had to keep uh, that XP Pro environment up and running and ready to go just in case I had to fix something, recompile it, and send it out there. But uh, but usually the, the Windows 7 environment, um, I, I've got, uh, what, Windows 8.1 and, of course, Windows 10 as, as uh, VMs. And then uh, I do have... Uh, uh, Linux Ubuntu on uh, as a virtual machine. I haven't used that in, in a little while, but uh, we tried to, to get the code working in that, but the ODBC drivers for Microsoft uh, SQL Server just don't exist, or at least in a, in a way that's really practical. Uh, though it's free, <laughs> it just doesn't work very well on that aspect. So I couldn't make that a mission-critical kind of uh, product released in that environment. Unless you wanted to spend fifteen hundred bucks for a good ODBC driver, which kind of defeats the purpose of people wanting to have the cheaper OS and machines and <laughs> right, all that. Yeah, so like, all right, was, I'm going to uh, go with the free version of Linux, and I'm going to spend thousands on my ODBC drivers. Yeah, that, that often. I mean, unless you're already committed to Linux, you know, across your enterprise, and you've got to go with it. I, I personally, I've always found getting ODBC on Linux to work difficult in general <laughs> yes yes and when i finally got it working it just didn't work very well <laughs> but that's more of a linux thing they didn't at the time when i tried it they didn't provide you had to like dig into the command line and stuff there was no yep. way to just you know configure it you had to you know you're googling around to try and find very well what file do i need where do i need to put this where do i need to put that and then exactly it, it uh, it's a little tedious so is your is your software right now Running on Windows or also Mac? Um, yeah, we release it uh, uh, both on Mac and Windows. The majority of our customers, of course, uh, use it on Windows, as they always had before, and, of course, continue that way. I do have um, uh, a growing number of companies that are running more of a terminal server environment, and um, even though they may even have just one location, they'll still run all of their users through just a thin client from their desktop. I don't prefer to do it that way. And most of our customers Citrix don't. or something? Um, it, my, uh, with Microsoft's uh, terminal services. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there is a handful using Citrix uh, for their uh, thin client kind of thing. But uh, there is one of our customers who is an avid uh, Linux person who uh, runs the IT side. So he's got the Microsoft terminal services running but all of the client desktop machines are all Linux with a thin client on it. So that's, it was an interesting environment. <laughs> huh? Wow. Oh, yeah. I've, I've, I only vaguely have used that sort of thing, but I think I have a neighbor here that, that actually runs something like that. And she works from home and has to use terminal services to connect to the office to do her work. And right. It always looked a little weird to me, but uh, you know, I suppose the IT departments like it because it, it makes configuring things easier. Yeah, they can go to a single point of configuration that to handle all of the users pretty much. But uh, it's harder to update our software. Say I have a release, uh, a new version of our product. And so the, the IT person would normally download that to their server. And then uh, all the users have a link to that little setup routine. We use uh, Inno Setup as well. And so they just double click on that link and they update their machine. Um, of course it won't update if they're in the product, you know, if it's running, so it won't update. So the problem with the terminal server environment, you have to get everybody out before you can do the update. Whereas if everybody's using, you know, uh, their own desktop for running my product and, and just talking to the database server uh, in between, then they can do that just one by one as they, need to or when when's appropriate and uh, it's a lot smoother that way but then you have the risk of some people on a little bit older version some people on a newer version that kind of thing but um, it is a little easier to get everybody updated just you know you get those it guys want to stick things on terminal services and because uh, they want control you know you know how <laughs> it goes <laughs> so for a database you're you're still using microsoft sql server yes uh Still running SQL Server, uh, intend to use that from here on out. However, now that we are 
pretty much fully Zojo, and I've just got those couple of com components to uh, routines to convert over. I would like to explore the uh, Postgres SQL, mm -hmm. that kind of uh, still has got to be a good enterprise level kind of database, uh, but the free option um, with a good support community like that is uh, definitely of, of interest uh, for me on those. Yeah, Postgres is definitely enterprise ready. I mean, that thing is seriously robust. I, I like how, you know, you can use it at a pretty basic level if you don't need all its, you know, super powerful capabilities. Sure. But it has all those things uh, if you need them. Do you, do you, what sort of advanced stuff on SQL Server would you use? Do you use store procedures or anything like that? Uh, no, we actually run pretty simple in order, and that's a very conscious decision we made through the years. Um, working with the VB environment and then now with the Zojo environment um, and the, the kind of changes that Microsoft tends to make um, uh, eliminating functions or changing the way things work that way. We try not to rely on the functionality of the database in more the, we, we don't put the triggers in or the stored procedures and things of that nature. We just use it as a database because it's good at managing that part. And that's the part we really need. It's nice and solid. We do put some views in there, um, and then I, you know, through the code, I just manage and, and add and alter those kind of views as necessary uh, for our program. But uh, we just use it as a straight-up database. So Postgres would be also, you know, very fitting for that kind of environment. Just uh, got to change some of my syntax so I understand it right. Uh, yeah, definitely. You, you, there's always syntax differences no matter what databases you jump between. Um offhand i don't know what uh specific things you'd run into with sql server versus postgres uh primary keys probably work a bit differently um, yeah i'm not not entirely sure either because i've been spending so much time just on the conversion of the code that i haven't had a lot of time to experiment um for that kind of thing so that's definitely going to take some serious uh, um experimentation time <laughs> shall we say <laughs> And right now, you uh, your software is solely a desktop at this point. Can you talk about um, not completely now. We've uh, we do have for uh, because we deal with forklift uh, dealerships primarily and other uh, industrial equipment dealerships like that. Uh, so they have um, they have their mechanics in the shop, but they also have their road mechanics uh, outfield with their service vans with their inventories in it and all that. So we have developed a, uh, a mobile web app that the mechanics run from their tablets in the field that they can receive their dispatch on and uh, they can record their time, record their parts usages, put their comments, you know, speak it in there with the you know, speech to text option that these tablets have, which is great. Uh, and so we've got a, a, a large um, and huge variety of different tablets in the field that are running uh, or accessing the uh, web app that we have. And of course it resides in the, at the dealership, usually on the same server as the uh, database, but sometimes in a separate one, depending on the size of the company. So we're able to maintain a very real time environment for the mechanics in the field. So as they make changes, they happen in the database real time. And as the uh, dealership on the desktop app makes changes in the database, the tablets have real time access to that change as well. So that's been a, uh, a big boost for us in the marketplace and, and uh, as a competitive kind of thing. I even had uh, uh, Christian from um, Monkey Bread Software at uh, one of our um, XTC conferences uh, wrote a, uh, a signature capture uh, option for the web app on the spot during the conference for me. And uh, we were able to incorporate that and he's done a couple updates to it since, but uh, that's been a really nice feature to be able to add to that. And then, we're expanding into transportation dispatch as well for our, our clients on the tablet that also collects the signature from uh, their customer you know, upon delivery and, and pick up and that kind of thing too. So yeah, we do have the uh, mobile web app um, that uh, supplements that for the mechanics on top of the desktop uh, for everybody in the office with the admin. So let's talk a little bit about the process you went through to migrate this a little bit. You know, just to give people an idea for, you know, people that are like, oh, you know, I, I might want to have a, I got an older thing that I might want to consider moving to Zojo. But I'm, I'm, you know, I find it 
a little daunting. How, how would I go about that? So, you know, what did you do? You, you, I, I'm going to guess you didn't, you know, go through line by line and just rewrite code. You, you must have taken a different approach. <laughs> well, it's a bit of a long story, shall we say. Um, I had uh, done a little bit of research and reaching out to uh, people that might have some insights for this kind of thing in the community. Uh, ran into a guy that uh, has become a pretty good friend uh, that uh, was using real basic at the time. Um, and he's it, it pretty, pretty sharp on it. And I told him what my dilemma was with, you know, I've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of lines of code. And this is, it was really, really daunting for me to even look at this conversion over to Zojo like this. And uh, he was actually writing a program that would do some conversion uh, on an automated basis, but it wasn't quite robust enough for the more complicated database environment that I was writing in. So he made a bunch of changes for me uh, along the way. We experimented and, and I tested and ended up converting a couple of uh, functions over, uh, like some vendor setups and uh, some geo inquiries, some sim fairly simple, straightforward stuff. And, uh, it worked, but it was um, a little bit clumsy in how the code ends up. So I tried that just for those couple of things and finally got a little more resolved to the fact that I'm going to have to do a little bit of just line by line, maybe some copy and paste with a lot of search and replace and that kind of thing. Uh, Cause some of the syntax is different. Uh, some of it just minor differences. Some of it's, um, uh, you almost have to do a little more structural change. Uh, but what I have found though, that is actually quite the advantage for me because it gave me a chance to relook at my code, relook at the logic, relook at the flow, uh, the efficiency and that kind of thing and understandable uh, kind of view of the code. It's like, uh, does this make sense when I read it like a book, you know, uh, do I have to, you know, add more comments just to make it more understandable? And it gave me a chance to rewrite that a bit. Still, you know, if it's, uh, how do I say? For the user interface aspects of things, that was pretty much, you've got to write that from scratch to make that more efficient uh, and, and fit the environment. But when it came to more bulk routines, you know, processing data kind of thing without a lot of uh, uh, front end user interface kind of things, that was more of a copy paste search and replace, and then manually update a couple of things here and there, and then away I go. So it's, it's kind of a combination of, uh, you know, kind of automated and some pretty much by hand from scratch. But all in all, it's made a much better product because of that, having to re-look at all this code and re-engineer a little bit here and there. Um, but it's definitely an advantage in that case for us. That sounds like a pretty good process, and often what I recommend to people when they ask me is, uh, you know, you, you often see on the Internet, or, and I'll even get people direct me, ask me, you know, hey, can I just run, you know, my VB code through something and get a working Zojo project? And no, no. That's <laughs> I've answer. tried, and, and it can be done with a lot of work, but it's not the cleanest way to do it for sure. Yeah, and, I, and I've run into that with other tools, too. I mean, it, I forget the name of the product, but there was uh, when I was doing .NET work, we had a, some enterprise software that was written in another tool, and they, wanted, they were talking about maybe porting it to .NET. And they brought in this company that was building a conversion tool that you'd run this old code through and you'd end up with a .NET project. But, and we had them there for a week showing us stuff and you know going through sample code and whatnot. But all you ended up with was... Uh, net code that was written in the style of this other tool. <laughs> so, you know, and it kind of worked, but you still had to go in and manually fix a ton of things. And, and you ended up with, essentially you ended up with a crappy .NET app. And it's the same thing when you move between any programming languages that are different, you end up, you may be able to get some level of automation, but I mean, it, you know, there's a lot of semantics in code that just can't be automatically so you still got to, you know, read it and think about it. 
And then even if it did convert your code 100%, you're going to end up with crappy code in the new environment. <laughs> <laughs> and we definitely don't want to do that, if, especially if we are the ones that are having to support that code for right. our customer base. <laughs> so it often can be an advantage to do what you did is to, you know, let's take a step back and, you know, redesign the parts that need that and then reuse, you know, the code that doesn't need that. And like you said, the, the backend processing type stuff, often there's, you know, years of business rules and other things in there that you don't want to monkey with or risk, you know, breaking. Exactly. So you just, you grab that as is, you, you know, update it for the syntax changes and you can use it. But other stuff you've, you've, uh, you've changed. And yeah, I think that's a good process. And the, the many, many apps, you know, I've always moved, you know, when I was doing enterprise software, you're always switching tools or something. Yeah, it's, it's been inevitable. An, an, yeah, it's inevitable. Going from DOS to Windows to... Well, hey, in my case, from mainframe COBOL to DOS to Windows to <laughs> Mac, etc. Oh, I don't go back that far. I started oh. with DOS, but... Uh... Did I just date myself? <laughs> Uh, yes, I, mean, I have I programmed on did. card punch cards. I have programmed that way before. Well, you've got me beat, Terry. Right. <laughs> Fortran, COBOL, you know. <laughs> uh, I have. I think I had a Fortran course in college. So when I was in college, they actually were still teaching Fortran at the time. It was a kind of a combo math course that they were using that had Fortran. Ah. Yeah, we had uh, my high school was uh, they had an IBM 370, I think it was. And uh, they had the old card readers, and we had a punch machine in our building, which was the math science building. And uh, we just, you know, hacked code on punch cards. And then the teacher at night would uh, take our cards down uh, to the uh, mainframe area, and they would run it overnight for us. And then we'd get our printouts in the morning, uh, whether, the, you know, the code worked or it had problems or it did work, and we got our nice print out of whatever, you know, we were doing. Uh, <laughs> those were the days. And that's when I started learning basic on a, a, a Radio Shack TRS-80 Model 1, if anybody remembers that. <laughs> that's the, is that the one that had the built-in little black and white display? No, or, it, or it, it was a separate. Uh, that was one that hooked to a TV. Right. You had an external okay. TV and you saved your programs on a cassette tape on an external cassette recorder. Yeah, I see. I do remember those days. So you know, us old guys can reminisce about that. But uh, yeah, I remember my yeah. first computer. I got we. I got it was an Atari uh, four hundred, I think, and oh, it, yeah. uh, we didn't even get a cassette drive with it at first. So I would spend you know hours typing in a program from a magazine, and I'd be begging my mom to let me leave the thing on overnight because as soon as I turn it off, I lo lose the program. So I, oh. I had to write. I still have here a binder in my office of handwritten copies of programs I wrote in basic on that computer that are written oh in a notebook because that's the only way I could have saved it for the first few months before we got a cassette drive. Cause you know, even back then those things were expensive. Oh yeah. And then we got a cassette drive and then you could save, but you know, it took like 10 minutes to save a little dinky program. Yeah. It was crazy. <laughs> yeah, with our 4k of Ram in our machines. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's a, you know, now I download multi gigabytes of stuff and it takes, you know, a couple minutes and I'm like complaining. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How come the, my internet's so slow? Come on, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I only get uh I only get sixty megabits per second download here and I'm like, Oh, that's not fast enough. I <laughs> yeah, I only get uh, about two hundred and forty, something like that incoming. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I, I, Jeff is in Austin, and he likes to brag that he gets a gigabit. Oh, I think it's must... up, up and down. Oh, yeah. Yeah. My up is only about six, seven, something like that. So he must have fiber or one of those kind of services. I would guess. Yeah, I forget which one. You know, Austin's kind of a tech mecca, so a lot of stuff gets tested out there. I think they have Google Fiber out there as well. So oh. they, they actually have competition for things, too, which helps to, you know, get some of the companies to put faster transfers in place. Well, up, here, up here in Maine, we, you know, you get one choice. We used to have Time Warner. They just got bought by Charter, and now they call themselves Spectrum. So <laughs> totally who can clear. keep up with all that, you know, <laughs> Xfinity, Comcast, you know, that whole thing, you know. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, and you never can tell. I was working away this morning, and I actually I went to go on the feedback, and I went to do search for something, and it it was just sitting there, and I'm like, what the heck? And I looked down at my cable modem. All the lights are off. <laughs> like, oh, great, internet. Uh, you know, something's down. Not the internet, but my connection to the internet is now down. I'm like, uh, and, and you know, it's always a, you know, pit of your stomach kind of thing because you never know, all right, is this just, you know, the cable modem's rebooting or is this a broader problem? <laughs> exactly. And now you're wondering, how am I going to communicate? You know, how am I going to, you know, surf the web or whatever? And it's, we've become pretty dependent upon that, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, especially for those of us, you know, I, like you, I work at home and, you know, if that goes down, you're like, oh no. I mean, I've got my, you know, iPhone as a backup that I can flip the switch to sell and, you mm-hmm. know, have that as a, a Wi-Fi router. But, you know, I don't have unlimited data with that. So that's more of a, uh, you know, still getting your email and doing the chats and stuff like that. Yeah. I think we've all had to tether to our phones from time to time. Uh, yeah. Just yeah. to keep things going. Phone tethering is a decent backup, but, uh, you know, when both Slow, those are works. out. Yeah. Then you're, like, <laughs> then you're like pulling out a book or a magazine. What is this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pages, paper, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We used to, uh, print our code from VB6 in, in, in three ring binders and, you know, keep that as backup kind of thing, you know, but uh, don't do much of that anymore. Just uh, keep our Dropbox or thumb drives or something like that now instead of printing it out. A little yeah, different. yeah, I do remember that, you know, everyone used to have a printer because you would print out source code to review it and stuff like that. I had a client years ago that I had made a Zojo project for them and they had gotten back to me. Uh, because they had to, you know, this would happen, but they brought, they got a lawyer involved and in order to, f- they wanted to file something on the software, like a copyright or registered or something like that. And apparently in order to do that, they needed to print out as the email set they sent me said, we need a printout of the first and last page of the software. <laughs> And, okay. You know, I'm sitting in my head just exploded. What does that even mean? There's no first or last page of the software. This isn't, you know, a, a, <laughs> Not a book. I think I told him this isn't a Fortran program from 1978. You, <laughs> I can't really do that. I said, I, I mean, I can print it and there'll be a page that's, I guess, first and there'll be a page that's last, but it's, it's yeah. largely meaningless. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so I, I did that. I did, you know, I printed it to PDF and I, you know, cut the first page and the last page and I sent it to them. They're like, perfect. Thanks. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it was it was totally me. It could have been anything. I but uh, but apparently some government entity still needs that sort of paperwork to file something. Go go figure. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. yeah. So you had mentioned when you were talking earlier, you got a uh, a studio somewhere around in your in your oh, yeah. over there. And well, before we, we started the podcast, we were talking, and I think I remember talking to you about this at XTC as well, because at one XTC, I had dragged a microphone with me to the conference because I had this grand idea that I'd record interviews with people and you kind of stitch them together into a podcast episode. But if you've never been to XTC, it's kind of a whirlwind. It's busy. Yes. <laughs> a lot noisy. Of <laughs> it's very noisy. Yes. So that that grand idea I had didn't end up working out too well. But I remember we were talking about microphones and stuff. And then before we uh, we came on here, we were talking about headphones. So tell me a little bit about this studio thing and, and what you, you use that for. Oh, gosh. Um, well, as I mentioned earlier, I did have that recording studio I, I did for my living there in the L.A. market. Um, produced and worked on a ton of great stuff with some great artists, uh, you know, world-class kind of people. Anybody in the old days remember Striper and those people? I've worked oh, with a lot yeah, of them. Striper. Yeah, remember that? Okay. Well, if you ever get in the studio with uh, Michael Sweet, lead singer there, watch your back. He is the ultimate prankster jokester in the studio. However, Oz Fox, the lead guitar player, is not. He's tunnel vision focused, no joking, nothing until we're done recording, and then he's you know comes alive. You know, it's just. Things like that, but he's all business. He's all business. All you know? business for a rock guitarist. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> kind of contradictory a little bit, but hey, it works for him. So, and he's a great, great, great player. Anyway, so um, uh, once I started this software company, uh, that kind of shortened my um, amount of time I'd spend in the studio. I'd still have it, but just not use it nearly as much. And eventually, just not 
at all. And then uh, at some point uh, here around the 2006 time or so that I moved from the LA area up to uh, here in the Spokane, Washington area. And uh, of course, technology is moving on and now we're not using tape anymore for analog tape. And then I had digital tape as well in the studio. Uh, I had 24 track digital, I think it was, which was kind of unusual on a smaller scale back then, but uh, worked well. But up here, it's all, you know, uh, yeah, well, I experimented with the Windows environment with the uh, recording, but uh, the Mac by far is a much better performer and all that kind of thing. So I uh, just ramped up my uh, Mac environments once I got up here in the Spokane area and uh, still had all my great microphone collections and things you just collect over the years because those really don't go, go out of style. Uh, just keep, that's kind of where your investment is. And uh, so I still do some recording here. Uh, I've got uh, some great local musicians to work with. Uh, my wife and I are part of a, a cover band that so we're getting pretty popular up here in the area. And uh, that's a lot of fun. But still use, you know, all that kind of stuff on uh, just a, a Mac Book Pro, um, using some great studio software there from Personas Studio One. I've switched over a lot of friends I know in the in the business are switching from Pro Tools over to Studio One, uh, like I did as well. And uh, just much better product. And, and I use it live for, as part of my keyboard setup for my sounds and things of that nature. It's a, it's a, it's a nice, nice product. So, But the studio, you know, do some great recordings. I'll have to send some over to you sometime so you can listen to some of the productions we've done. Uh, here uh, totally. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it's amazing what you hear about is how good of a studio people can really end up having just at their homes. Uh, you, even, you know, big name bands now, you often read about them and they'll say, yeah, you know, this this album was primarily recorded in the lead singer's home studio or something yeah. like that. Well, some people have, uh, even back in the day, they were taking apartments and converting them into studios uh, as the uh, equipment became smaller and more compact and you can do that. Uh, but now, as, as long as you know what you're doing uh, from the acoustic standpoint, you can use most rooms uh, to do a decent job unless you're doing, you know, big productions with live drums or orchestra and stuff. And then you need a little more specific kind of environment. But um, not everybody's using live drums anymore, unfortunately. Uh, you know, sad from a, a drummer's perspective, as I am as well. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you can do some r remarkable recordings in just a, a bedroom or a, you know, a, a, you know, playroom or something, you know, just uh, as long as you know what you're doing with your acoustics and how you mic things up, uh, particularly with your vocals, get your little portable mini booths or whatever you want to call it. They have a little uh, 180 degree wraparounds that you know, wrap around the mic or so that uh, can make a big, big, big difference in the quality and how things come across. You know, regardless of the quality mic you have, you still have to control those uh, acoustics to make it work. So what I like to tell people is, you know, Zojo developers, they're a talented group and uh, they're, they're good at lots of other things as well. Oh yeah. Well, not to mention the, I, I'm kind of a jack of all trades and master of none. If you want to call it that, I do do a lot of photography and uh, done some cinematography and put some short films together and things too. So, <laughs> you know, gotta, gotta use what you got. Have fun yeah, at it. And that's great. But it's all Mac based, you know, <laughs> Yes, and we're recording this uh, right before WWDC, which uh, is next week in uh, California. So uh, we'll see what new Mac-ish things that Apple seems worthy of talking about at the, uh, the conference. Yeah. And speaking of conferences, I do want to remind people that the Zojo Developer Conference next year, 2018, in Denver, Colorado, a brand new location for us. You've never been to XTC. You want to be there. Terry's been to a billion of them, and <laughs> I have the T-shirts to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> He's wearing one now, as a matter of yes, fact. Yes, I am. <laughs> and XTC is a blast. Right now, we have early registration, so that essentially means you save money if you register earlier. Now, of course, that means you're registering before you necessarily know what the sessions are or anything like that, what the activities are going to be. But rest assured, the activities are going to be fun. They always are fun. And the sessions are going to be amazing and informative because at least half are done by Zojo customers, like Terry, like other yeah. people that have been on this podcast. And then the other half are done by Zojo staff. So you get a lot of neat information. And then, of course, all the people that you talk to. But 
might otherwise not have an opportunity to talk to. I know a lot of people sometimes will uh, blow off a session so they can hang out with someone in the lobby and have an actual conversation. So, you know, do what works for you. So check it out, zojo.com slash XTC. You know, if you want to save some money and you're looking to get to Denver, which I hear is quite nice. I've never been myself. Oh, that's uh, very nice. You'll like it. Sign up before October. You get plenty of time and save yourself a little bit of money with early registration. All right, Terry, I want to thank you for being on the Zojo Talk podcast. This was fun. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Have a great day.